You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Regular viewers of Newsmakers know that public education is one of the four issues that we return to on a regular basis. Back in April, in the midst of the turmoil, the 3,100-member Cincinnati Federation of Teachers, the CFT, elected new leadership teams. When the longtime CFT president, Tom Mooney, became the president of the Ohio Federation of Teachers a year ago, he was succeeded by Rick Beck, a trusted member of the Mooney regime who had headed several teacher negotiating teams in contract talks with the Board of Education. In April, the Mooney-Beck era ended when the teachers voted in landslide fashion, 1,280 to 364, for a ticket led by Sue Taylor. I am joined this morning by Sue Taylor. Sue has taught in Cincinnati Public Schools for 22 years as a social studies teacher, a point in her credit, and most recently at Hughes Center. Sue, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you very much, Dan. What do you think it says that in April, not only did, and it's not just you, it was a whole slate of people, and I want to keep emphasizing that, uh, a, a very different slate of people one in such a convincing fashion. What's that tell us about where the teachers are right now? Well, I think it tells us that teachers wanted a change in terms of the leadership of, of the teachers within the Cincinnati Public Schools. And I think it tells us that in very great numbers, um, they put their faith and their trust in my leadership for the future. But why did they want that change? What, what was it that's on their mind? Is it a concern about the CFT as an organization, or do you think it was a concern about the direction of the school? I, I think in part it was a bit of both. I think that they saw me as a leader with new ideas and fre fresh approaches. I think that they saw um, a difference in CFT in terms of I campaigned on a platform of listening more to the members, campaigned on a platform of attempting to increase democracy and attempting to have the CFT leadership be more accessible to the teachers in the schools. And I don't think they had seen a campaign that really was at a grassroots level and where um, the candidates did go to many schools and take calls from individual teachers. Um, and, and it was that grassroots effort that I think won over the teachers. I think they saw um, a very well-organized platform statement in terms of my ideas um, short-term and long-term goals for the district. Let's talk about that. What, in your mind, are the priorities for the district? Now, not so much the internal organization of the CFT, uh, but for the district. What, what are your priorities? Well, my basic priority that drives everything that I do in this district is to increase student achievement. And to do that in a way um, that makes sense to the teachers, that we bring the teachers along and they understand um, things that we know from research and from practice that will cause more student achievement, um, that teachers' voices need to be uh, heard more in terms of district initiatives that are designed to raise student achievement, like the school accountability plan, which evaluates schools in the district according to state standards. So everything that drives me um, has to do with student achievement. and my leadership to listen to teachers to raise student achievement in ways that teachers um, that are doable and make sense for teachers. The issue that got focused on uh, by the press from the outside, and I'm, I don't know, you know where this ranks, was the whole question of the evaluation system that had been announced with great fanfare, one na uh, sort of national attention that Cincinnati was out front as a school system saying that they were going to uh, evaluate teachers and tie that evaluation to raises and to salary. And that system had been created by the administration in cooperation with the CFT. My understanding was that you were raising serious questions about that system. Is that true? Oh, that's absolutely true. And I think the administration also acknowledges that there were serious implementation problems and we're currently working. Um, to try to straighten out the uh, severe implementation problems that manifested themselves throughout the course of the year. What are those problems? Um, there are a great number of problems. One is that there was a portfolio requirement for teachers that was absolutely excessive. Not only was it absolutely excessive, but it was ill-defined. 
teachers didn't know exactly what they were to put in that portfolio. Teachers didn't have an understanding for how the portfolio would be evaluated, and that portfolio was a major component in terms of the teacher's grade, if you will, uh, for the teacher's evaluation. Now my understanding is in this first <laughs> year under this new system, approximately one-fifth of the teachers were part of this first year trial evaluation. Is that correct? Um, it was not a trial evaluation. It was the first year of implementation, but you are correct. About one-fifth of the teachers who were undergoing a comprehensive Did evaluation. Did the people who were part of that comprehensive evaluation, that one-fifth, are their salaries next year tied to what happened this past year? No, they're not. Um, to, to the extent that their rubric score does not determine their salary, you're correct. Because it was sort of an introduction to try to work out the bugs, right? Yes, but if we vote for the pay for performance aspect of the system, then the people who were on evaluation this past year, 1999, no, 2000, 2001, when we vote on the system in May of 2002, their rubric scores for last school year okay. will determine their pay for the next so year. So even though it isn't been affected this year's salary, the scores will affect long-term salary. Pay. Correct. Okay, and let's make clear, because uh, I'm not sure everybody understands, there is another vote. Even though this, the, the teachers voted to adopt this last September, as I remember, there is another vote this coming May about about what? What will that vote be? Let me clarify that, Dan. Um, the vote that we took in September of 2000 was what we called our teacher quality vote. Um, that included things relating to professional practice school interns. That included our career and teaching program. That included <coughs> excuse me, aspects of the peer assistance and evaluation program. And in terms of it, it included only the evaluation component of, of the big initiative to evaluate and pay teachers in, in a new way. So we voted on many aspects of, of teacher quality reform, one being the evaluation system that we accepted, and then contingent upon the outcome of implementation of the evaluation system, teachers will have an opportunity to vote in May of 2002 on tying the evaluation scores to okay. pay for performance. So you have an option to, in effect, not to continue the evaluation system, but not tie it to salary. That option exists. Okay. You said there were many <laughs> problems this first year of implementation. Uh, where are you right now in terms of, do you think the administration, the board, is responding to those problems and therefore we would get to a point where you could recommend uh, passage in May or what do you think where do you stand right now on the vote next May? Well, where we stand right now is we're going through um, all of the details of the implementation um, system from last school year. And we've had a number of research data um, studies conducted so that we're able to have a full array of, of uh, different opinions. You as the CFT have, have conducted these studies or the in, CFT in cooperation with the schools? We've had a myriad of different research studies, some of which were commissioned and done exclusively by CFT, um, some done in cooperation with, with the district. So about four or five sets of research data. And the findings have been consistent. So even though there were many different um, sources to get at the data, the findings are pretty much consistent, one being that the portfolio was ill-defined and excessive. Um, another being that um, while stress is good to keep us on our toes, that last year's system did cause undue amounts of stress uh, for teachers with so many unknown aspects. Okay. I want to move on to another topic. Many teacher friends of mine, not in any official capacity, not in, they're, they're not officers in the CFT or anything, sure. have said to me over the past few years, Stephen Adamowski was brought in here to break the union. Do you believe that? Oh, I think Stephen Adamowski was brought in here to help us as the large urban district raise student achievement scores. Um, my goal is to be able to establish cordial relationships with Steve um, to work together, and we're in the process of attempting to do that. Do you think, though, it was part of that was to break the union? I, I can't conclude. I don't have any evidence to believe what that. Do, how, what, how would you evaluate the job that he has done up till this point? I, I think the community reaction is uh, very positive. Steve 
uh, that we've made great strides and progress and and my hope is to use my voice to let the community know that a lot of the progress that we've been able to make in terms of proficiency scores and um, s incremental steps but nev nevertheless steps up in student achievement that were made not due only to his leadership but because we were willing you know to do things differently and and think and work outside of the traditional box and so um, I hope that answers your question. Well, uh, somewhat. Um, this fall, there's going to be a election for four board members, which constitutes a majority of the board. There's seven members on the board, four are up for election this year. In the past, Tom Mooney was very active in the Democratic Party, and although the CFP and not its own in its union role, but in other guises, frequently got involved in trying to push forward certain candidates, support or not support certain candidates. What will be the role of the union this year in terms of board elections? Well, obviously we will, we will take a large role um, because that has a direct impact on um, student achievement and relationships between teachers and the administration. Uh, as you mentioned earlier in this broadcast, we are a brand new slate. Uh, we have some members with some experience. So I'm real thrilled that Diana Porter, who's a long-term um, activist in CFP and in the district, is heading our politi political action committee. Um, that committee did just uh, convene to make recommendations. So we're in the process of getting that started. I did let Tim Burke know that I personally wanted to sit on the screening part of the Democratic Party representing CFP, that that is the issue that you mentioned is such a large role in what we do and we have such a great impact. That, that I will participate personally. We're almost out of time, but is there a board member that you really would like to see defeated, or a board member that you absolutely want to be sure gets reelected? Um, at this point, I think it would be unfair of me to answer that question. I have some personal feelings, of course, but I will respect the work of our committee and let the committee screen candidates and bring recommendations to us. Okay. Thank you for being here this morning. Look forward to having you back in the future. Thank you. Good Dan. luck with the work. Thanks. Stay tuned. If Cincinnati is to address the challenges it faces, it is important to make sure the right questions are being asked. After the break, I'll be joined by an African American business leader who worries whether in all the scramble to do something, we are asking the right questions. Welcome back. In the aftermath of the April disturbances, many groups from Cincinnati CAN to the ARIA group leading the court-ordered mediation on racial profiling lawsuits to church and community groups are holding public meetings and roundtable discussions. But what if these groups are not properly framing the question? Bill Cox, the president of Cox Financial Corporation, is the vice chair and the only African-American member of the powerful Cincinnati Business Committee. Mr. Cox has drafted a three-page statement laying out the issues as he sees them. I have invited Mr. Cox to join me this morning to share his pers perspective. Bill, welcome to Newsmax. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. You know, what? this is an interesting document. What is it that prompted you to put it down on paper, to put your ideas down on paper? I got a feeling the ideas have probably been around for a while. Absolutely. Why, why put them down on paper? Well, I see us floundering. I see so many people providing so many solutions when they don't understand what the problem is. They haven't den identified the problem. And there's an old saying, a problem well stated is a problem half solved, and that's where we have to start. We have to identify unemotionally the, the issue and the problem. And uh, we're going to get into specific sections of your, your letter here, but what would you say, is there a summary statement that you would say is the way to define the problem in your mind that maybe a lot of people are missing? I, I think there is. Uh, for far too long, too many people, and I don't, you don't have to mention the uh, ethnicity of those people, have been shut out of the American dream. And when it became politically incorrect to treat people this way, we decided that they should come in even though they weren't formally invited and we found they were academically, emotionally, uh, financially uh, uh, not prepared and uh, we thought less of them as a result of that. And many who were, they were so few and so alone that it made it very uncomfortable for those people. 
you know, that's actually was going to be the first bite that I was going to read out of your uh, first sentence out of your letter that I was going to read. And one of the things that, that you make the point there about people who did move in and, and moved up and, but feel uncomfortable, I wonder mm -hmm. if you're talking about yourself. I mean, you're someone who has been very successful. Uh, you are in the inner circles. Uh, I mentioned the CBC. There's a lot of boards you serve on sure. uh, in the community. Do you personally feel uncomfortable? Sure you do. It, it's natural and normal to gravitate towards people who you are most like. And we have made race an issue, which is not an issue. This is not a black-white issue. It's an economic issue disguised as race, and we continue to raise the specter. And so in a board meeting, I can't go or get along by saying one dumb thing after another. Other people can do that because the specter will be raised. Does he really belong here no matter how well you do? And so I would ask those who may not be African American to ask themselves if every event they went to, everything that was meaningful, everything that you needed to do to move forward in life, if everybody there always was different from you in an obvious way, how comfortable would you feel and how would you explain that to your children who ask themselves each day, am I fitting in and am I part of the culture? It is preoccupying. And, and I'll die being uncomfortable, but the motive is you have to include yourself each and every day. That's my responsibility. I don't know uh, your personal situation. Do you have children? Yes, five of them. Do you think your children will be more comfortable than you are? Without question, they already are, and I admire them very much for that. And that's our role. Our role is to build a platform for other people. Hopefully I've done that well, and, and they are much more comfortable. I have to say, and this is something I was talking to some people about yesterday, that you and I graduated from XU yes. at the same year. Uh, I have two grown children, and I have to say that they are in a very different place yes. than, than I was, am, and I see that as very positive and, in the end, hopeful. Absolutely. So it's, it's interesting that you say that. I want to go to uh, a couple of the sections of your letter. I actually want to take what is what I was going to do second, just for the people who are going to put this on the screen. Uh, at the bottom of the first page of, of the letter, you say, you issue a challenge to whites and blacks, quote, those who don't know people of another race and feel they have never done anything inappropriate to people of another race must be most engaged. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you mean by that? Uh, people have a tendency to do the Pontius Pilate. They wash their hands of an issue. All of us in America, black and white, have benefited from the, the uh, ravages of slavery. And therefore, all of us are bound to be part of the solution. And to think that it was something that somebody else did it is not sufficient. We are part of a community, and when a problem exists, we all have to work on that problem. You know, maybe the way that I would personally say that because of my own background is that history is meaningful, that it continues to shape us who, as individuals and shape us as a society. I well mean, said. That's, uh, that's just who I am. Let's, let's go on to a, another uh, uh, passage. On the second page, you challenge a number of people in the black community, as I read it, who have organized special interest groups. You write, we need to stop separating and segregating by chamber of commerce, by union, and in our schools, and begin to include and engage with whom we feel we have differences in a positive and constructive manner. Those who can but won't respond, who are able to improve but choose not, who wallow in pity while having the means, must be left to their own devices. Sometimes, in order to lead, men and, to lead men and women, you must turn your back on them, literally and figuratively. Tough words. We have limited financial and human resources, and any good person wants to help everybody. That's not enough today. We have to make decisions about who will respond and who we will help because of those limits. If there are 10 people against the wall who purport to need help and we can only save six, we have to save those six and live with the weeping and gnashing of teeth of those four. Everyone does not wish to be saved, and it is morally wrong to try to save people who don't want to be saved and risk uh, injuring everybody else. What about the section separating and segregating by chamber of commerce, by unions, and in our schools? Are you raising a question here? You're part of the business community, one of the le leaders of the business community. Raising a question about the African-American Chamber of Commerce? 
too many people fought and died in order for us to go wherever we want not to be segregated. I think it is in a personal affront to then go backwards and say we're going to come together and separate from the whole. The part can never be greater than the whole, whether it's in a family, whether it's in a business, or whether it's in a community. And when you say to the whole, your interests and your needs aren't important to me, you don't sell people that way. You engage people and you sell them by helping them understand that if your interests are served, their interests will be served as well. So do I understand the motive for it? Yes, I understand the motive. One of the keys of being successful is that we have to function comfortably in the midst of discomfort. That's one of the keys of being successful. I go out, no one wants to get up every day and say, geez, I think I'll go out and make myself uncomfortable. Well, I do that every day. And other people have to do that every day so that their children will be better. Hmm. Interesting. Another passage. We are asked to listen to younger people who complain about their lot in life while failing to take advantage of education presented to them, who haven't worked anywhere for a meaningful period of time, who use excuse after excuse about how the system has failed them. It isn't that the system has been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and too often left untried. People who will not do what they can because they can't do what they want and too frequently have failed to prepare themselves for what they say they want. Now, you've involved yourself a lot with helping the schools. Yes. About helping young people. Mm -hmm. I know that's part of your commitment, your yes. personal commitment. Again, tough words towards young people. Well, we need tough love, and it's not all their fault. Our generation has created a generation of leaders. Uh, we've been too busy in pursuit of the American dream that we've forgotten the parent, and so we've created a group of people who really don't understand some of the issues. Uh, somebody said, it's hardest of all to remain modest as a giver and keep close the open hand out of love. Nobody makes anybody drop out of school. Nobody makes anyone have another child that they can't take care of, and nobody makes someone not go to work. Uh, it's one thing to have been victimized. It's another thing to think of yourself as a victim. Two things have to happen. People in the white community have to dispense uh, with the idea, the subtle arrogance that this is their problem to lead, this is the problem that we have in part of the African-American community, and we must assume leadership. Everybody deserves the self-esteem, the positive feeling that comes through doing for yourself those things you can do for yourself. So to wait and call on a group of people who have shown no propensity to solve the problem to me is ludicrous. You have to take your fate in your hands, and you have to do it from within, and you have to form a real partnership. As opposed to saying, go do this for us, you have to say, this is what we're prepared to do, and we're going to join in a partnership of equals, which we're going to lead to make our entire community better. You know, one of the, uh, one of the things that the, the last section I wanted to read, and I just want to get this real quick because it takes us to some summary statements. You write, people who blow hot and cold breath at the same time, people who would threaten to shut down business on the one hand and simultaneously ask for money on the other are people that you don't have. Sounds to me like that's directed at the black united front, is it? It's directed at anybody who breaches their integrity by hurting the community and then simultaneously asking to give money. You cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. And when somebody threatens my capacity to take care of my family, that antagonizes me, and it does not influence me positively uh, to do so. We have uh, 45 seconds or so. Where, with Cincinnati can or with other efforts, are you hopeful about what's happening right now, or do you think we need to step back and start over? You can't have fear without hope or hope without fear, therefore I am both. I, I am hopeful, but, and, uh, but I still remain concerned because I don't think that many of us understand the real issues. And last thing, you know you'll get criticized for making these kind of statements. As I tell people all the time, that's part of uh, doing the right thing for the right reason, as T.S. Eliot tells us, and I wish more of us would step up and do it. Well, thank you very much for laying out the ideas and being here this morning to thank talk you, about Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week. 
to meet the men and the women shaping our community for the future. Have a good week.